the evening. Joining me now with analysis on this explosive new Washington Post report, we have the sheriff of uh, Wakimico County, Maryland, which is Mike Lewis, who's been brought in to help. Um, sheriff, w welcome to the program. Uh, I want to go to this Washington Post article. A prisoner sharing the police transport van with Freddie Gray told investigators that he could hear Gray, quote, banging against the walls of the vehicle and believed that he was intentionally trying to injure himself, according to an investigative document that now has been obtained by the Washington Post. Can you confirm that is true, sir? It's consistent with what I heard while in Baltimore City earlier this morning. Yeah. So, in other words, the prisoner who's now currently in jail, the one that reported this, he, there was a metal partition. He couldn't see, but Gray was in there by himself. He heard the, the banging. There were three separate occasions when they stopped. What else do, we, do you know and have you heard about the arrest itself and the condition of Mr. Gray when he was put in that van? Because this would suggest that an entire new narrative about what happened to Mr. Gray is emerging and that that would mean that that there was another, and I mean, this has now happened many times, a rush to judgment without any facts by the president and others on down. Sean, it's consistent with the information I heard from a number of uh, Baltimore City police officers while in Baltimore uh, in the last couple of days. It is certainly consistent with what I heard uh, regarding his character. And uh, it's, uh, this is no surprise to me what I've heard tonight from the Washington Post. When we look at what's the, the, the timeline of all of this, police said they don't know if he was injured during the arrest or during the 30-minute ride in the van. Um, we know that the account by the prisoner is contained in an affidavit is one piece of the ongoing investigation in all of this. Um, but what, what we do know is that he was able and stood on one leg and climbed into the van on his own. Wouldn't that suggest that he was healthy when he got into that van? certainly appears to have been healthy when he got into the van. How big a deal is it that the van driver had to stop three times, once to put him in leg irons because the officer described Gray as irate? Isn't that standard procedure that they would usually put them in leg irons and put a seatbelt on the, on the prisoners? I've done it many times, Sean. We've been instructed, actually. I was a trooper for 22 years. We were provided with tools to actually hog tie a prisoner and strap them to the bottom of the seat frame in the police car to prevent them from injuring themselves, to prevent them from kicking out our windshield and damaging equipment in the police car. This is common procedure for any law enforcement to protect the prisoner and certainly to protect themselves and any damage in the vehicle during transport. I've had to pull over a number of times to re-secure a a prisoner who's even gotten out of the best of the the rope that we've used to actually tie them that is issued equipment uh, when I was a Maryland State Trooper. Is this a fairly common thing where prisoners become irate and bang against the walls and injure themselves? Not just bang against the walls, but bang against equipment inside the vehicle. We've had them strike their head many times on in-car cameras, mobile data terminals, shotgun racks, rifle racks. There are many, many things in the cockpit of a police car. And when you're transporting a prisoner, we normally transport our prisoners in the front seat. We don't have cages in our cruisers. We oftentimes transport them in the front seats. And we've actually had them split their heads wide open on the side window, on the B-pillar, or on equipment in the car. It happens. We've had to pull over and re -secure our prisoners just to get them transported yeah. five to ten minutes down the road to a local jail. Five minutes after the first stop, they had to stop again, and the driver of the vehicle with the prisoner in there, with Mr. Gray in there, had to get another officer to help him check on Gray. And at that point, they said they found Gray on the floor of the van and put him back in the seat, still without restraints. And that's the point where he asked for medical assistance. But that was after the prisoner reported that he was banging up and down against the walls. Um, let me ask you this question. It's a political question, but we've had a lot of high-profile police cases where the President of the United States has weighed in. One is the Cambridge Police acted stupidly. Two, the Trayvon Martin case. Three is uh, the Ferguson case. Three White House representatives were sent to the funeral, funeral of Michael Brown, who robbed a store, intimidated a clerk, fought a cop for his gun, and charged at a police officer. And in this case, two White House representatives were sent, and the President gave a long lecture yesterday. As a law enforcement officer, what, is, what are your thoughts about the president commenting, he's a constitutional attorney, without any evidence or facts having been presented to the public? It's disgusting. It's despicable. It's a kick in the face of all law enforcement before the facts of the case are even known.
Yeah. Let me ask you, I, I have spoken to a number of high-profile law enforcement people in Baltimore, and they have all confirmed to me that a stand-down order was given on Monday by the mayor herself with the comment, even if there's looting on the ground, you know, it's only property. Have you heard that? Sean, I was never addressed by the mayor. I was never addressed by the police commissioner. But when we went to work immediately upon arriving in Baltimore City, it was after being ordered, um, quite honestly, uh, to particular areas within the city after an urgent request came out from our governor, Governor Hogan, asking for additional assistance to go into Baltimore City. In response to this request, uh, we deployed 10 deputies uh, from the Wicomico County Sheriff's Office to Baltimore City in an armored vehicle. An armored vehicle special request they had made. When we got there, I was told by a number of senior officers, commanding officers, who were a delegated authority throughout the city, um, that uh, we, we had orders to stand down, that orders had been given to stand down, and there were many, many Baltimore City police officers. I was assigned to Baltimore City Police Headquarters and City Hall. That whole three block radius was ours for the entire night, and there were dozens, not a few, but dozens of police officers coming in and out of our barricade, and we talked to many of them. They got out and talked to us. They were warned. They were clearly clearly worn out and they were embarrassed they apologized to us many times for having to come to baltimore city they said we're embarrassed that our mayor told us to stand down we're embarrassed that our mayor allowed us to get pelted this is ridiculous i heard people actually saying i'm done i'm through my heart broke for these guys and girls it truly did and, and there were many many young and senior officers that made these comments as they came in and out of our barricade it wasn't just mike lewis that heard this all my deputies heard this and we stared at one another in total disbelief that these men and women were sent into harm's way and told to stand down while multiple felonies, multiple felonies being committed in their presence. It wasn't just the arson. It wasn't just the burglaries. It wasn't just the break-ins. But these also being, they were being pelted with bricks. Now, a brick weighs about five pounds. A half a brick is two and a half to three pounds. Then they're being struck by bottles. Then they're being struck by rocks. I heard it. I had a Baltimore City Police radio on my person for the two days I was up there. And these guys were going through hell. And all I could hear was retreat or stand down, stand down. This was over the radio. I heard it with my own ears. And I couldn't understand for the life of me what was going on. I have never in all the years, and I, I have many family and friends in, in the police department and law enforcement agencies around the country, I've never witnessed the police retreating as they did as bottles and rocks and bricks and boulders thrown at them the way we saw. You know, it's funny, you, you're using almost the exact descriptions that I heard from my sources today, that morale was low, that they were embarrassed, that they felt like they were not allowed to do their job, that the city was being burned to the ground, and they were told not to do the job that they signed up to do, and they were disgusted. Sean, I had one gentleman approach me uh, within the barricade around City Hall, uh, wrapped his arms around me, and, 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 and sobbed in my arms, just very embarrassed that we had to be there. I got to tell you, when the governor sent the Maryland State Troopers in, the National Guard in, and sheriff's deputies from across the state of Maryland, we made our minds up. It wasn't going to go the second night like it went the first night. We were going to hold these thugs, these lawless thugs, accountable. It was not going to be committed in my presence and be told to stand down. I can assure you that. And my deputies had their orders. Other deputies had their orders. The troopers had their orders. We were not going to stand down. We were there, and we were going to bring it to them. All right, Sheriff, thank you so much uh, for being on with us, and stay safe on the streets. Thank you for what you're doing for the good people of Baltimore tonight.